hunter and the hunted, the weak, the wounded, all the gains, all the glory. Vain godlike Egyptians taught civilization much about the benefits of slavery, the half-man, half-animal philosophy of power. The Romans' military expansion explored the limits of colonialism, and European kings and queens plundered distant lands in the name of religion and progress. The children of Leopold I, the first king of the Belgians, included Leopold II of Belgium and Carlotta of Mexico, Empress Consort of Maximilian I of Mexico. To expand one's colonies, it's useful just to marry into the country, much cheaper than all that expensive warfare. Carlotta was part of Europe's early trade policy with Central and Latin America. Here at the Palais de Colonie at Tavern, just outside Brussels, the private corporate wealth of Leopold II was displayed. The price of Leopold's vast, vainglorious building projects was about 10 million dead Congolese. Nothing personal except the profit, it was just business. Europe is therefore not surprisingly, viewed with deep suspicion when it comes to foreign trade today, former colonial nations, such as Argentina, are openly hostile to European investment, while others, such as Brazil and Colombia, are largely in favour. International trade and investment touch upon so many aspects of people's lives around the world. Trade also clearly shows the added value of Europe working together. Trade is a powerful foreign policy tool. It must support Europe's wider international goals, promoting our values, peace, freedom, democracy throughout the world. ¿Qué prioridad otorgaría a las negociaciones con América Latina y en particular a la renovación del acuerdo comercial con México? Thank you very much. No, it is true and I apologize. I haven't mentioned Latin America at all. Uh, of course, um, having an agreement with Mercosur there would be, be fantastic. It's a, it's a big potential and untapped market would be good for us and them, but it is a very protective market and so far we have not found the ways to, to advance in our negotiations. The United States is the more glamorous policy angle for Cecilia Malmström, the new European Commissioner for Trade. TTIP is a policy priority and Latin America remains the poor relation, not just in economic terms, but in political terms too. Our companies should not think that they go there and they do whatever they want and they get rich literally overnight and then they left a ruin behind them. No, I think it's also about treating people wherever they are with respect, be decent, pay them decently and actually imply the the same standards that uh, they imply in, in the European Union. Europe has been negotiating a trade agreement with the Mercosur region for several years. The progress has been painfully slow. The overall negotiation for a bi-regional association agreement also covers political and cooperation pillars. These negotiations with Mercosur were officially relaunched at the EU Mercosur Summit in Madrid in 2010. The objective is to negotiate a comprehensive trade agreement covering not only trade in industrial and agricultural goods, but also services and establishment and government procurement. With Mexico, it is a priority. We have an old agreement with Mexico. Uh, there is an agreement between the European Union and Mexico that we should upgrade it. We are right now in a so-called scoping exercise to see what can be done, what are the different ambitions from both sides. We are in a similar exercise with Chile. Uh, maybe it would take a little bit longer, uh, but this is also clearly a, a priority. We are confident that she will have a forward-looking trade agenda because we are very much in need of advancing our trade agenda in the European side, taking into account that we have very low growth in Europe, so we need to take advantage of the growth that comes from, from elsewhere in the world. Europa está en crisis y cree que la crisis para salir de esa crisis va a ser eh, el tratado de libre comercio para provocar, digamos, más riqueza para sus empresas. Sabemos que la riqueza de las empresas no resuelve la crisis que tenemos en Europa y al contrario la profundiza y además crea una crisis en América Latina. The problem is that some European corporations still have a reputation for behaving like Leopold, acting with a disregard for human rights. Advocates of free trade with Latin America stress that with more trade comes a stronger democratic structure, a better legal system and less corruption. With the new generation of free trade agreements, we have specific provisions that are aimed to build capacity locally, to help local communities and to bring more the civil society and the local stakeholders to, these, uh, to take profits of this new trade and investment possibilities, but also do it on a more uh, 
structured way and one that respects human rights and uh, a minimum level of social and environmental standards. Civil society campaigners argue that with free trade comes a growth market in hypocrisy. European companies apply one code of conduct in Europe and a much lower standard in Latin America. Nosotros, por ejemplo, hemos recibido denuncias de empresas de vigilancia privada, inglesas como españolas, por violar los derechos a los sindicatos y a sus traba trabajadores, lo que no están haciendo en Europa. The EU and Central America Association Agreement is based, according to our view, on a very asymmetrical model, trading raw materials from Central America for um, products with a high added value from the EU. For example, in 2010, Central America exported mainly bananas, pineapples and coffee, whereas the EU exported vehicles, pharmaceuticals and chemicals. Complementarity is the key word from both sides. I think from the European side, uh, Europe has a deficiency in protein and Brazilians and Argentinians are the biggest producers in protein, for example. So why not accept that? On the Brazilian side, for example, uh, Europe can sell, of course, technology, uh, more sharp and cheap products. This kind of model has been said by many to really the benefits only go to a very small part of the population. For example, in Guatemala, in 2012, the UNICEF alerted that the chronical malnutrition level for children from the age of zero to five years old is reaching an alarming level of 49.3%. So, whereas on the one hand, the country is exporting to the EU, the country does not have enough food to feed its population. In the recent article, What Free Trade Has Done to Central America, Manuel Perez Rocha, an associate fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies in Washington, DC, and Julia Pali, associate editor of Foreign Policy and Focus, argue that free trade agreements don't deliver many of their advertised benefits. Perez Rocha and Paley highlight the example of the Dominican Republic Central America Free Trade Agreement. They explain why the pact has had a devastating effect on poverty, dislocation, and environmental contamination in the region. And perhaps even worse, they say, it's diminished the ability of Central American countries to protect their citizens from corporate abuse. Farmers have been displaced when they can't compete with grain imported from the United States. Amid significant levels of unemployment, labor abuses continue. Workers in export assembly plants often suffer poor working conditions and low wages, and natural resource extraction has proceeded with few protections for the environment. Communities are not happy on what is happening. They, are, they don't agree. They not, haven't been consulted, always consulted on what they want to do. And sometimes when they are consulted by their governments and the companies, uh, their decisions, they're not respected. In Latin America, we have to distinguish between the countries and I want to say the leadership and the ideology of the leadership in some countries. Bolivia and uh, Ecuador do not want very much to hear anything from the European Union. They rather engage in sort of verbal uh, battles. They do not like at all to be criticized. While, for example, countries such as Paraguay, such as Colombia, they accepted the criticism. They tried really to be honest, to give us all the information. It's a huge difference, I would say, in the behavior. European companies in general, I would say, and in particular the big, uh, the bigger companies that do bigger investments, they are very much involved in activities in the ground to support local communities, because this is also part of their image. Are we now in a post-colonial age? Is Europe too sensitive to accusations of colonialism? Should European trade policy be more assertive of European values, having learned from the great mistakes of the past? Should we use our substantial economic muscle to advance equality and a human rights agenda? Puede y debe hacerlo, pero tiene que hacerlo con mucho respeto. Eh, hay que huir de todo tipo de paternalismos. Eh, Europa no puede ir con el pecho hinchado a Latinoamérica a enseñar nada ni a dar lecciones de nada. Pero no es menos cierto que los acuerdos eh, va implícita la preservación y el respeto a los derechos humanos y una serie de, de, de conexiones o de conciertos en los temas eh, sociales y económicos que son valores compartidos. I wish human rights situation would improve also in the European Union, but of course also in, in Latin America. We are talking probably about 
different scales of uh, human rights violations. But nevertheless, I think that we are not perfect uh, as well. One of the trends that we've been witnessing more and more lately is that trade is becoming more and more political. Trade is being very much used as a tool to foster development, but also to foster sustainability in the, in the areas, to create political stability and economic growth. So I think trade, if it's used uh, positively to improve uh, the stability, the political stability, but also the economic in the, in the world, is definitely a, a weapon that we should use also as, as European Union, because I think we have some responsibilities as well in this area. Fighting for democratic freedoms, transparency, accountability has been the cornerstone of my political engagement in this parliament, in the council and in the European Commission. And I would like to bring that commitment to trade policy. Malmström previously held the Home Affairs portfolio. As she begins to look towards Latin America, will her experience with justice and security issues influence her approach to trade? Will Europe use its economic strength to advance human rights? Or will Malmström's legacy be the rise of corporate colonialism? Thank you.